two kinds of motion. This is what the discussion's about. First type, the type Aquinas is talking about is action that requires the continuing action of the mover. It's, it's, it's motion that requires the continuing action of the mover. His example uh, on the second page of the reading is as, the, as the, the staff is moved by the hand. So imagine a walking stick, right? It moves this way, it moves that way, only so long as I'm using my hand to move it. If I take my hand away, the stick doesn't move on its own, except maybe to fall to the floor. Okay? It only moves as long as I move it and not in any other way. And the second type, which I think is more familiar to us, the second type of type that does not require continued action by the mover. And this is what we're more familiar with, with Newtonian ideas of inertia, right? Where I throw a ball, the minute the ball leaves my hand, its trajectory is gonna be determined by the forces on it. I don't do anything more. I can go have a sandwich. I don't really throw it that hard, but if somebody did, the ball's gonna do what it's gonna do based upon the force that's been impelled to it by my hand. I don't do anything after that. I've changed, I've already changed that system as much as I'm going to. Now it's up to gravity and wind resistance and anything it might encounter in its trajectory. But it's not me. I don't do anything. That's not the kind of motion that Aquinas means. And if we think of that as the model for the motion, we're gonna miss the point of his proof. So here's my illustration. My example for this, if this is a baseball, this is my shuffleboard example. I'm going to try to make this clear, and then I'm going to go to the discussion board and share that with people in this room and the rest of y'all. Let us imagine that next week I hit the lottery, and so I'm taking us all on a cruise, okay? The whole class. Nothing, no, no, no one of you is any more special or less special than the other. You're all coming with me to celebrate my good fortune. Unfortunately for you, you have broken your leg and you have to lie sick in bed in your cabin on the cruise for a couple of days. We all feel very bad for you. We come visit you, we bring you fruit, but you are laid up in bed. Now to cheer you up, because I am a nice guy, I have decided to play a trick on you, okay? Just to entertain you and amuse you while you are sick in bed. I have gone and I have collected all the shuffleboard pucks from our deck of the cruise liner. And I have assembled them in a long line, touching each other on the deck outside your door. This is the door to your cabin. Okay, your, your bed is facing the door. And at the far end of this line of shuffleboard pucks stands me. And I've got a shuffleboard stick and I'm going to be pushing them past your door. Just This is just fun okay, to amuse you. Now, what happens as you are alert, you are sitting up in bed, you are looking at this. Let's imagine this whole, I can't erase them and redraw them. This whole thing is shifting here. So the first one comes into view. And you say, that's odd. What is causing the shuffleboard puck to move? Slowly. The second one comes into view. You say, ah, now I know. The first one's motion was caused by the second one. But now I also wonder where does the second, what's causing the second one to move as it moves? Because I know it's not moving itself. And I discover as they come into, each of them comes into view, three, four, and five. Five causes four, four causes three to move, three causes two to move. This is all fine, but it's plainly not, not a full explanation for what's happening. Because no matter how many pucks there are, five or 10 or 50 or 500, I know that at some point, there's me as a different type of being at the end of the line as the first member, right? I'm the, or the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the regress terminator, the RT. I am the unpushed puck pusher, okay? Whatever else is going on, until you see me, maybe you never do see me, all you see is a line of, of shuffleboard pucks moving past your door, you can conclude that each one is the cause of the one in front of it. But you also conclude this entire system of pucks requires something else entirely that is not itself a shuffleboard puck in order to explain its motion. 
Now notice, this is the kind of motion that requires my continued action. If I go away or if I get tackled by the crew and they, they haul me away for stealing all the shuffleboard supplies, the motion stops. It's only so long as I am continually pushing the stick that the things move by your open door for your amusement, I hope. So that's the kind of motion I'm talking about. And that is, Aquinas says, the kind of relationship that God has as the regress terminator of this action of actualization. One thing actualizes another. One thing, each thing is actualized by something else. Back at the beginning of that, acting continually, like right now, today, in the universe is God as the actualizer of things who is not himself being actualized because he's already fully actual. So to take a look at, with 10 minutes left, the discussion prompt, I'll share it for the people in this room. Okay. Uh, the quote from Aquinas, subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover. That's what this is meant to illustrate, right? These pucks move only in so far as and for as long as I'm moving them. But I said, this is not the only concept of motion we have. We have the idea that if I throw a ball, the ball continues to move regardless. And you could think of motion in the universe like this. Like this is the way Benjamin Franklin and other deists, it seemed, thought about the universe. God's like a clockmaker. God made the universe, put natural laws in it, laws of motion, wound it up, set it in motion, and then he's hands off. That's one way of thinking about motion and change in the universe. It's not Aquinas' way. Aquinas is thinking of this constant sustaining of the actualization of things by the first actualizer, which is God. <clears throat> 